Well, we certainly have a large task at hand today. Uh, again, we're in this 31 week series and today we're gonna talk about Daniel. And remember, we're, and I'll share with, remind you this again in the teaching, uh, but we are doing a Bible survey. And as I share, as I um, will point out that the caveat to that is we don't spend, uh, we don't read every single chapter, every single verse. So to say that we're gonna cover Daniel in one week is, is like, okay, let's see how you're gonna do this one. <laughs> So we've got our work cut out for us, but I think you're really going to uh, be challenged this week as I was preparing for it. Uh, but before we do that, I wanna lead us and use a call to worship. And I wanna use Psalm 115 verse one, that's going to go, that gives us a little sneak preview, a spoiler alert into what we're gonna be talking about today, okay? And in Psalm 115 one, the author of that Psalm, the Psalmist says this, not to us, Yahweh, not to us, but to your name, give glory because of your faithful love, because of your truth. Let me read that one more time. Not to us, Yahweh, not to us, but to your name, give glory because of your faithful love, because of your truth. That's what I pray and hope that we not only do today in our time together, uh, worshiping God through the, through singing of song, through uh, the teaching of the word, uh, looking at looking at the scripture, but we would do that this week as well. Uh, in between our time where we come together and worship Him, that we our lives would be orchestrated as such, would be um, lived in a posture that is concerned and consumed and passionately um, wanting to bring God His glory, and I pray that we do just that. Everything. 
for Jesus there's nothing impossible So today we're going to be talking about Daniel. Uh, Now, as I shared with you, we are in this 31-week series called The Story, and we are in about week 18, so we're well over halfway there. Well, just a little over halfway there. And as I shared with you before, what we're doing is we are going from Genesis to Revelation, and it's a Bible survey, which means we're not drilling down on every verse or every chapter, every verse. And so we're kind of hitting the main highlights. Now, the caveat to that is this. We're covering some major territory in, in one week at a time. OK, so today, for instance, we're going to be talking about Daniel. We could spend weeks and we could spend 31 weeks in Daniel. Right. So I pray that that won't be a distraction. But we can, we can, what I hope and my prayer is that we can extract out of Daniel um, a couple points here, the big points of Daniel. Uh, and that's what, our, that's what we're going to attempt to do uh, today. So with that being said, I'm going to employ or utilize a video uh, done by Tim Mackey. And Tim Mackey, if you're, you might be familiar with him, you might have heard of him. He does this um, thing called the Bible Project, and he has these videos on YouTube uh, as well as some other places. And Tim Mackey is just an excellent, I think he's an excellent teacher. And so what I want to do is, this video is a little bit longer, but it does a fantastic job highlighting the overall panoramic view of the book of Daniel. Okay, so with uh, if we could just kind of jump into that, please just lean into this and watch this video and lean closely into this and hear him as he um, 
talks about and teaches, and it's done through animation. So just kind of lean into it and, and listen very intently on the overall picture of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. The story is set right after Babylon's first attack on Jerusalem, and they had plundered the city and its temple and taken a wave of Israelites into exile. Among them were four men from the royal family of David, Daniel, who's later named Belteshazzar, and his three friends, who you probably know by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This book tells of their struggles to maintain hope in the land of their conquerors. The book's design seems pretty simple at first. Chapters 1 through 6 contain stories about Daniel and his friends in Babylon, while chapters 7 through 12 contain the visions of Daniel about the future. But this two-part shape is made even more interesting by another design feature, and that's the book's language. It begins in Hebrew, the language of the Israelites, but chapters 2 through 7 are written in Aramaic, a cousin language to Hebrew spoken widely among the ancient empires. But then in chapters 8 through 12, it goes back to Hebrew. This design shows how chapters 2 through 7 are a coherent section, but it also highlights the importance of chapters 2 and 7 for understanding the later chapters of the book. Let's just dive in. Chapter 1 introduces the basic tension of the first half of the book. Daniel and his friends, they're really wise and capable, and they're recruited to serve in the royal palace of Babylon. But they're pressured to give up their Jewish identity by living and eating like Babylonians and violating the Jewish food laws found in the Torah. So they refuse, and they choose faithfulness to the Torah, and it puts them in danger. But God delivers them, and they end up being elevated by the king of Babylon. After this begins the Aramaic section, which you'll see has this really cool symmetrical design. So first, the king of Babylon has a dream that, it turns out, only Daniel is able to interpret. It's about a huge statue made of four types of metal, and it symbolizes a sequence of kingdoms, and the head is Babylon. But then a huge rock comes flying in, and it shatters the statue, and it becomes this huge mountain. Now this dream is the first of many symbolic visions in the book, and this one introduces the basic storyline of them all. Daniel says that the statue represents a train of human kingdoms following from Babylon, and they will all fill God's world with violence. But one day, God's kingdom will come, and will confront and humble the arrogant kingdoms of this world, and fill the world with the healing justice of God's reign and rule. After this, chapter 3 tells the famous story of Daniel's three friends, who refuse to bow down and worship a huge idol statue, which, like the statue in chapter 2, represents the king and his imperial power. And so the friends are persecuted, they're thrown into a fiery furnace, but God delivers them from death, and they're exalted by the king, who now acknowledges their God as the true one. After this come a pair of stories about two Babylonian kings, the father, Nebuchadnezzar, and then his son, Belshazzar. They're both filled with pride because of their imperial power, and so, like in chapter 2, God warns them both through dreams and then visions, which, also like chapter 2, only Daniel can interpret. He says that both kings are to humble themselves before God, and both kings arrogantly resist. So Nebuchadnezzar is stricken with madness. He becomes like a beast in the field. But then he humbles himself before God, and his humanity returns to him. He's restored as king. This is in contrast with his son, Belshazzar, who doesn't humble himself before God, and he's assassinated that very night. Now, these two stories draw this imagery from Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and Psalm 8, where humans are depicted as the royal image of God. He's given them authority to rule over the beasts of the field and the birds of the air on behalf of God, who is the world's true king. But when human kingdoms forget that, when they rebel and make themselves and their power into a God, they become less than human, like violent beasts who will face God's justice. Which brings us to chapter 6, the pair of chapter 3. And this time it's Daniel who's being persecuted, because he refuses to pray and worship the king as a god. And so like the friends, he's sentenced to death and he's thrown into a lion's den. But God delivers him from the beasts, and like the friends, the king exalts Daniel and praises his god. Which brings us to chapter 7. It's the pair of chapter 2, and the center of the book where all its themes come together. It's another dream, but it's Daniel's this time. And ironically, he can't understand the dream until an 
angelic messenger explains it to him. He sees a series of four beasts, one like a lion, then like a bear, then one like a winged leopard, each of these symbolizing an arrogant kingdom. And last of all is a super beast, identified as a really evil empire, and it has lots of horns, a common symbol for kings in the Old Testament, and there's one specific horn who is an image of an arrogant king who exalts himself above God and persecutes God's people. Now they are symbolized by a figure called the Son of Man, who's an image for both God's covenant people, but also for their king from the line of David. But then all of a sudden, God, who's called the Ancient of Days, comes and he sets up his throne. He destroys the super beast and he exalts the Son of Man on the clouds where he comes up to sit at God's right hand and share in God's rule over the nations. We can look back now and see how all of these stories in the first half fit together. The three stories of faithfulness despite persecution, these are meant to offer hope to God's suffering people among the nations. But they suffer because human kingdoms have rebelled against God and have become beasts. And so these visions encourage patience, that God's people are to wait for him to bring his kingdom and rule over our world and vindicate his suffering people. But it raises the question about when God is going to do that, and that's what these final three visions set out to explore. In chapter 8, Daniel has another vision about the final two beasts of chapter 7, but this time they're symbolized by a ram, who we're told is an image of the empire of the Medes and Persians, and then by a goat, who's an image of ancient Greece. And out of the goat come a whole bunch of horns, one of which symbolizes the evil king from chapter 7. And we're told more about him, that he will attack Jerusalem and exalt himself above God and defile the temple with idols. However, in the end, he will be destroyed by God, who will exalt his people and his kingdom. Now by chapter 9, Daniel is very puzzled, especially as to when all of this is going to take place. And so he consults the scroll of the prophet Jeremiah, where God said that Israel's exile would only last 70 years. So for Daniel, the 70 years is almost up. And so he asks God to fulfill his promise soon. But an angel comes and informs him that Israel's sin and rebellion has continued. And so their time of exile and oppression will continue on seven times longer than Jeremiah envisioned. Daniel is deeply disturbed by this, and he has one final vision. We're shown the same sequence of kingdoms. It's Persia, then Greece, and Alexander the Great, followed by lesser kings, all leading up to this final king of the north, who will invade Jerusalem, set up idols in the temple, and exalt himself above God. But then, all of a sudden, this king comes to ruin. Now, there's been endless debate about what all of these visions refer to. Many see a clear connection to the exploits of the Syrian king Antiochus in the 160s BC. He killed many faithful Jews in Jerusalem and set up idols in the temple. Others think it points forward to the Roman Empire's role in the execution of Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. And still others think it will be fulfilled in future events that have yet to happen when Jesus will return. Now the problem is that the symbols and the numbers, they don't quite match any of these views perfectly. But it opens up the possibility that in a sense, they are all right. The book of Daniel has been designed to offer hope to all future generations of God's people. It did so in the days of Antiochus' empire, and it has ever since. This is why Jesus could use imagery from Daniel to describe and confront the oppressive leaders he confronted in Jerusalem. This is why John the visionary who wrote the Revelation could adapt Daniel's visions and apply them to Rome of his day and also all future oppressive empires. And so the point of Daniel is that all generations of readers can find here a pattern and a promise. It's a pattern that human beings and their kingdoms become violent beasts when they glorify their own power, when they redefine right and wrong, and don't acknowledge God as their true king. But Daniel also holds out a promise that one day God will confront the beast. He will rescue his world and his people by bringing his kingdom over all nations. And so for every generation, this book speaks a message of hope that should motivate faithfulness. And that's what the book of Daniel is all about. See, I told you that was, uh, he does an incredible job, I think. I mean, just an incredible job. So uh, let me say this as we start. Um, when I was growing up, uh, in my teen years probably is when I heard this the most. My, and I've shared this with you before, but my dad had a saying. You know how our dads always have these sayings that, that um, they kind of just, it's, it's their dadisms, right? We all have them. Um, and so one of the things, one of my dad's dadisms uh, that really stuck with me too, 
is back in those years, teenage years especially, he would make this statement. He would say, you know what? You are not at the center of the universe. Meaning that the universe, or he would say it this way, the universe does not revolve around you. And to me, you know, I get it. You know, at that age, I was like, yeah, whatever, I get it. But I did understand uh, a little bit what he was saying. I did understand it at that time, uh, what, the gist of where he was coming from. And it wasn't just the dadisms, but there was a lot of wisdom, and don't tell him that. But there was a lot of wisdom to that. As I continue on in my spiritual journey and continue to read scriptures and be molded more into the image of Christ, there is extreme, that is a very profound statement. The universe does not revolve around me. And here's the problem. Uh, many of us do believe, and I think you can see it in our world today, even more so in, in our society's worldview, that the world does revolve around um, each person, right? And if you contest that, we have a good old-fashioned argument what we have. And people don't know how to deal with that. We don't know how to debate. We don't know how to have conversations when we disagree about things. Because, and I think some of that is because the, we are convinced that the world does revolve around us, that the universe does revolve around us. We are the center of it. Now think about this for a second, because some of us that are, very, that are Christians, and we've been Christians for a long time, um, I, there was one, uh, an individual that made this statement. He said that we are willing to be God-centered. We're willing to be God-centered. Actually, um, I believe it was John Piper that said this. Uh, we are willing to be God-centered as long as we think and we feel that God is man-centered. Now think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. We are willing to be God-centered as long as we think and feel that God is man-centered. I think there's a lot of truth behind that. I think it says it's saying the same thing, that we are at the center of the universe and God should be revolving around us, correct? But here's the deal. God is not, capital N-O-T, underlined three times in bold, God is certainly not man-centered. Now I get when we look at the cross, when we look at salvation and God's grace and mercy and His... His um, his, his lo unconditional love, it's very easy to think that we are at the center of God's universe, right? But Scripture seems to suggest otherwise. Now again, I don't want to, I don't want to confuse, I don't want to dissuade us from thinking that, that God doesn't love us. That's not the point I'm making. But God is at the center of the universe. We are not. Man is not. Mankind, men and women are not at the center of the universe. Listen to the words of Isaiah in chapter 48, uh, verses 9, and 11, 9 through 11. He says this, and this is Isaiah speaking, God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. He says, I will delay my anger. Why? For the honor of my name. He goes on to say, and I will restrain myself for your benefit and for my praise so that you will not be destroyed. And in verse 11, he says this, I will act for my own sake, indeed, my own, for how can I be defiled? And then I want you to listen to this last sentence in verse 11 of Isaiah 48. God is saying this through Isaiah. I will not give my glory to another. Let me read that one more time. I will not give my glory to to another. Now, as you can see in the book of Daniel, that's what Tim Mackey uh, illustrated to us through the Bible Project. Uh, you know, his that animation of the overall panoramic view of Daniel is that is just that how man's kingdoms continue to put themselves in the center of the universe and wants to take God's glory. And the whole book of Daniel is showing us that God will not give His glory away. His glory is His glory. In fact, that is our role, is to showcase His glory. That was the role, assignment, whatever you want to call it, of Adam and Eve, right? It started clear in the garden to showcase God's glory. Everything thereafter, our creation is about giving God His glory, showcasing God's glory. Let me read another passage of Scripture to you uh, found in Ezekiel chapter 36, and we'll look at verses 22 through 23, and then verse uh, 32. And so in verse in um, chapter 36, starting with verse 22, he says this, Therefore, to say to the house of Israel, 
This is what the Lord God says. It is not for your sake that I will act, house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you profaned among the nations where you went. I will honor the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. The name you have profaned among them. The nations will know that I am Yahweh, the declaration of the Lord God, when I demonstrate my holiness through you in their sight. And then in verse 32 of that same chapter, he says this, It is not for your sake that I will act, the declaration of the Lord God, or yeah, the declaration of the Lord God, let this be known to you, be ashamed and humiliated because of your ways, house of Israel. God is saying, you're bringing me shame. It is about me and only me. You exist to bring me glory. You are not at the center of the universe. I am at the center of the universe. And it seems the Bible continues to, 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 to uh, communicate this to us over and over and over again. Man's kingdoms continue to strive, continue to compete for God's glory, and God has nothing to do with that. In fact, jo James Montgomery Boyce, a theologian from uh, many, many years ago, uh, made this statement. He said, this is the sin that God can't deal with. This is the sin that God will it just does not that, that that God does not deal with well, right? Of course, he doesn't deal with any sin well, and he would point that out in his in his writings from Daniel chapter four, which we're going to look at today. But but James Montgomery Boyce, what he's saying is this: it God does not share his glory. John Piper writes extensively and speaks extensively about this as well. God does not share his glory. It is His glory and His glory alone. And so under this framework, under this umbrella or this foundation is what we look at the book of Daniel through, the lens in which we look at the uh, book of Daniel through, like I said. And if you leaned into that uh, video with Tim Mackey, that's what you see. These kingdoms from the past or the present, our past, but in that time, the present, these kingdoms that were competing for God's glory and then future and how God dealt with those kingdoms. God didn't, does not do well with mankind stealing or trying to steal, attempting to steal his glory. It's about God and God alone. I think a passage in Scripture, uh, one of the passages of Scripture that I read many, many years ago, and I find very um, disturbing, um, and I underlined it then, and, and I, again, I think it, as more I read, you know, you see that it kind of is the thesis of the book of Daniel. But if you would turn to uh, Daniel chapter 4, and I think this is, the, again, the thesis of, thesis of his book in a sense. Um, it, it start in verse 28, and let's read through 33. And listen to what it says. It says in verse 28 of chapter 4, All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months as he was walking. Now listen to the arrogance, the pride. As at the end of 12 months, as he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, the king exclaimed, Is this not Babylon? Now, can you sense the pride? Is this not Babylon? The great that I have built by my vast power to be a royal residence and to do what? to display my majestic glory. Wow. King Nebuchadnezzar is crossing the line. And we're going to see what happens. Listen to these next words. It says that while these words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared that the kingdom has departed from you. You will be driven away from people to live with the wild animals and you will feed on grass like cattle for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over the kingdom of men and He gives it to anyone He wants. He goes on to say, At that moment the sentence against Nebuchadnezzar was executed. He was driven away from people. He ate grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with dew from the sky until his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Nebuchadnezzar crossed the line, and you can see it right here. He, the arrogancy, 
And that's the pride. That's what we see uh, that, that really got Satan kicked out of heaven, right? This, I will do this. I will do this. This, this pride, this, this arrogancy that says, I will, th- it's about me. The center of the universe revolves and circles around me. And God says, no, 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 it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And, and that's what we see here with King Nebuchadnezzar. And essentially, that is kind of the book of Daniel, right? Kingdoms competing for God's glory. For, for God's glory, and it's God's and God's alone. God's glory will never be stolen. He will never give it to it's His glory. And clear through Scripture, I'm just going to reference some Scripture here very quickly for you. But throughout Scripture, this is what we, we read that we were created. All, it's all about God's glory. It's not about our glory. It's not about us. It's not about us being the center. I get that because of the cross, because of God's great mercy and salvation and grace, we are the recipient of that. But we, but it's not, it's, we are not at the center of that. God is at the center of that. Ephesians 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, it talks about us being predestined for what? For His glorious grace. Not ours, but for His glorious grace. Isaiah 43, 7. We were created, He created us for His glory. Ezekiel 20, 14, it talks, about, it talks about the grace of God finally bringing them out of the wilderness. Remember the Exodus and they wandered around the wilderness for 40 some years so that generation would die off. But it talks about that God brought them finally to the promised land. Why? For His name. 1 Samuel 2, 22, we read about how they wanted a king. How they wanted a king, and Samuel was offended, and Samuel was like, no, God is our king. We live under a monarchy, a theocracy. God is our king. We don't have an earthly king. We don't have a man that's going to lead us. God, Yahweh himself, is our king, and they demanded a king. And God says, God spares them for his name. Romans 15, verses 8 through 9, it basically says that God sent Jesus to what? To the Gentiles for His glorious grace. We look at the life of Jesus, and in John chapter 12, verses 27 through 28, Jesus comes to His final hour. For what purpose? For God's glory. For the Father's will. It was about the Father. It wasn't about so much about us, even though we are the recipient of His grace and salvation. My point is this. May we never lose sight that God demands His glory. And God's not going to share His glory. That is a line that if we step over, there is going to be some significant negative repercussions. God is about His glory. So let me ask you this question. How do we bring Him glory? If God is about His glory, if it's about God's glory, we were created to bring Him glory. We were created uh, because of His glorious grace. And we are here for that and for that alone. How do we do that? May I suggest it's through our prayers. You know, may I suggest, uh, you know, if you read Jeremiah 14, 7, it's about His name's sake. So then our prayers become for His name's sake. You know, my, my prayers should be oriented around, not so much about God deliver me, God deliver me, although I get that, that's part of our prayers. But at the end of the day, why should He deliver me? For His name's sake. So our prayers take a shift away from us and place them on, we place our prayers on God. The, the direction of our prayers, the intent of our prayers is about God and for His name's, name's, name's sake. Our salvation. Psalm 79.9 says this, for the glo- not for my glory, but for your glory. I'm kind of paraphrasing it. For the glory of what? Of your name. It's not about me, but it's about you. Psalm 115.1, your name, not mine. 1 Corinthians 10.31, a very familiar passage, but it basically says this, do whatever you do, whatever it is that we do, do it all paraphrasing it, do it all, do everything for what? For His glory. That's why we exist. 
Guys, I could go clear through the scripture. We could spend hours, we could spend days, months, years talking about only that, that we are created to do what? To bring God His glory. How do we do that? As I said, our prayers become reoriented around. We acknowledge that our salvation is really, <laughs> it's not so much for us, although it is, we're the recipient of it, but it's He saves us for what? For His name, for for the glory of His name. Does our salvation, does your salvation, is it about you or is it about for the glory of God's name, bringing God glory, not ourselves? Everything you do, everything you do, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, as I shared with you, 1 Corinthians, do, is it about everything you do, is it about, are you doing it for one purpose, and that is the glory of, of God, of Yahweh. Isaiah, I want to close one last time. Isaiah, or, or share this as in closing. I want to share this passage of Scripture with you uh, one last time. If you want to turn back there with me, let's, I would invite you to do that. Let's look at that. Uh, back in Isaiah chapter 48, we kind of started off with it. But I want to read it to you one more time. 48, verses, uh, verses 9 and 11. Let me read it to you one more time. God says this, I will delay my anger for what? For the honor of my name, and I will restrain myself for your benefit and for my praise, so that you will not be destroyed. Verse 11, I will act for my own sake indeed, my own, for how can I be defiled? And here it is, I'm gonna leave you with this. I will not give my glory to another. Are you trying to steal God's glory? Do you take credit for things that, that you shouldn't take credit for? That it's God's, God's the one that should get the credit. God's the one that has orchestrated all things. Are you living your life as such that, that it points to you, that you draw the attention to yourselves? That, you know, and I get that's our humanness and we struggle with that at times, right? We want to be validated. I get that. I understand that. I understand that temptation. I understand that. But at the end of the day, do you catch yourself? Do you allow the Holy Spirit to arrest your spirit? To acknowledge, hey, I'm trying to bring myself glory here and this is not for me to do. I am not going to rob God of His glory because at the end of the day, He will not give His glory to another person. It's His and His alone. Are you bringing God His glory or are you trying to rob God of His glory? My prayer is that you're a person that wants to bring God His glory and again, we do that by, a, by surrendering and having a posture of humility and contriteness to the power of the Holy Spirit, which guides, who guides and directs and leads us. Is that your life? Is, would, that be, would that articulate and characterize your life? That your life is about the surrendering to the Holy Spirit for, the one, for one particular reason, and that is this, to bring God His glory. Spend time in some of those passages of Scripture. Go back and read uh, Daniel. Read some of Daniel. Re revisit that chapter 4, okay? Revisit chapter 4, uh, verses 28 through 23, and ask yourself the question, is this about me or is this about God and His glory? It's great being with you and spending time with you. I pray that you will, just, you will have a great week, but most importantly, I pray that this week you will bring God His glory.
rock, a oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God.
Come and 